back. We get some calls from pharmacies regarding drug interactions, and a lot of times they won't tell you that this is their concern, serotonin interaction. So I thought I'd give a brief talk about it. This is when the whole thing started, 1984 in Cornell. This girl, she was a congressman's daughter. Um, presented to the ER with those symptoms. See, phenyl phenylzine is a, a psych med. Like, um, it's a monamine oxidase inhibitor that uh, we prescribe for schizophrenia. Um, it's not popular anymore. It's actually the last uh, drug on the list to be used because of its, uh, this serious interaction that was reported that year. So she got, got Demerol in the hospital. Got worse. And then she died. Then it was a big lawsuit about it. Uh, the doctors who were involved were in suspension, and um, what happened was when they did the autopsy, they found cocaine too. Um, with further studies, we know now that phenylzine and mevrodine can cause serotonin syndrome, and cocaine makes that actually worse. So doctors got actually off the hook because she did not tell the ER staff that she was doing cocaine. That could have changed the way they're treating her. They probably wouldn't give her memberdine. So, this is the problem. You, you know, we have 27. <laughs> yeah. Anybody guess how many Americans are affected with depression? 82%. As, uh, no, it's about 10% of the population. That's how it's diagnosed. Close to 30 million. <laughs> We see higher here because pain patients or pain population will probably have 50%. Is it 50% of pain patients are depressed? At least 50. Yes. Actually. That's why we think it's higher, but its overall population is 10%. What? <laughs> <You know. laughs> this is just a brief uh, slide to show you how serotonin has been built in our system. Tryptophan to 5-HT to serotonin. And uh, melatonin also is uh, a breakdown of serotonin. So you see, uh, oh yeah, there you go. Those two enzymes are responsible for breaking down serotonin. So if we give the patient any drug that prevents those two enzymes from doing their work, we'll have more serotonin in our system than we should. And then when serotonin syndrome can happen. Don't bother much with this. It just gives you an idea. And serotonin is everywhere in our in our body. Everywhere. Functions on the CNS level. Mostly motor and mood. Cardiovascular is, is it keeps the stability of the uh, cardiovascular system. Bronchoconstriction and emesis. Couldn't find recent studies regarding um, SSRIs, morbidity, because they've been around forever. Uh, that was a big number. Like you see, the total death uh, of 50,000 exposure was about 100. And they found that the most of the um, the death from SSRI overdose is not actually the drug itself. It's more of the suicidality that comes with it. Uh, however, serotonin syndrome is also is part of those 100 people that died. So drug interaction is a possible problem, too. This is what I want everybody to know. Just have in mind, when we prescribe, uh, the physicians prescribe, or the pharmacy call us, or anesthesia service in the in the OR that our nurse will be aware of the syndrome. So you see here, those are the categories of medications that can cause the serotonin interaction. Um, anything that helps building serotonin, over-the-counter stuff, tryptophans.
something that inhibits breaking down the serotonin. And I'll send the slides, whoever is interested, so you get, we don't have time to go over this extensive list. You, you see that the, um, the category three increase in serotonin release, a lot of stuff is illicit, and some, some of it something that we prescribe here. It's like we prescribe Depakote, we prescribe Tigritol. Yes. Yeah. This is two. Boost bar, LSDs. See cocaine, methadone, tramadol. Anyone knows what phenylpiperidine opioids are? Those are um, fentanyl and ramifentanil. At least think about it as fentanyl. This is the one that we use here. Um, other non-opioids should not cause the problem. Reglan, Zofran. So you can tell from this list, we probably have seen patients who are on five of those drugs. And they did fine. And the reason is I'm coming to it. So not everybody gets the, the, the drugs, get the interaction. There are factors. <coughs> So first, it's not idiopathic. It's not like it happens to ramp, it doesn't happen to me, because our genes are different. It is more predictable outcome of the drug dose. You can see all age group, 15% of people who overdose on SSRIs. This uh, one here is important, can happen with a single drug, not necessarily interaction with other drugs. So watch when you're starting the medicine and when you're upping the dose. Up to five weeks of discontinuing. Like you stop the medication. If this medication has a long duration of action and then you're starting a new medicine, it doesn't mean that it's gone from the body. So the key of, of this report is if you administer the drug alone with no other drugs on board, the patient's probably safe. So what caused a perfect storm is a combination. And most reports actually implicates uh, MAO inhibitors, which we do not use often anymore. Uh, but I still see psych use uh, phenylzine I mentioned, seldaline is Parkinson disease, so just keep eye on those. Those are the worst ones. Having said that, I've seen fentanyl in recovery room when I worked in Penn State. Uh, the agitation, uh, patient got febrile, and one of the doctors called, he said, that's a serotonin, do not push Demerol. It was the same scenario, just... Uh, and then uh, we give the patient midazolam. We had to intubate that patient. Patient recovered with no problems. So, so just to, um, I'm gonna skip methylene blue unless Dr. Shah wants to, because we don't use it here. It's, do, do you use it a lot in, in surgery? Okay, because methylene blue can cause serotonin. Just I wanted to know this. Methylene blue is is very similar to phenylzine. Similar to the anti the chemistry is very similar. Were you using that for anything? Yeah, GYN, GYN, do you use it? Uh, urology. The only time I ever used it was for joints. Okay. So for if something was inarticular. Yes. To see if it leaked. But you don't use it here. Do, do you? Okay. Can cause the problem. So I'm just gonna skip that. Indocarmine is related to it, so I'm just gonna skip that too. Okay, Zofran or Indensitron can cause the problem. You can see a report in 08 in um, an infant, also Turco reported one uh, receiving mirtazepine, which is an antidepressant with Indensitron. Reglan we use a lot. Um, 
There are reports of serotonin when it's administered to patients who are NSSRIs. So this is probably the most important slide. So we have three reports here of serotonin syndrome patients given phenylpiperidine opioids to patients who are on SSRIs. And it's mainly fentanyl. So take home messages, fentanyl and demerol and methadone. Those three drugs can cause serotonin syndrome when given to patients with SSRIs. So why not everybody gets the problem? Genetic variations in either the enzyme that metabolize serotonin or in the receptors. So we're all different. That's why, but it's still predictable in terms of it's going to happen. It's just a matter of the dose. Um, maybe... Um, for example, I, I give Denise 5 milligrams, she gets the response. I need 10 to get the response. Diagnosis. The I'm going to come back to that, but I just want to show you here. Look at the differential diagnosis. Look how um, many uh, syndromes out there can actually uh, look like serotonin. Again, I can send you this uh, slide too. The key is tremor. Pay attention to that. And patients reporting agitation. Those two things. When the patient calls with that or a pharmacy calls, just think of said, what are you giving the patient? Look at the medications. And, and if there is SSRI on board, then it's serotonin. If there's no SSRI on board, it's not a serotonin syndrome. You can see this one is the severe uh, presentation of it. It would look like malignant hyperthermia, if anybody heard of it, or neuroleptic malignant syndrome. It, it's really, it, it, you know, it gets to, if it gets to that point, it will be very hard to differentiate which syndrome and what is causing the issue, and then we treat the patient supportively because we don't really have a diagnosis. Hunter, I like that slide because it actually takes you down how to diagnose it. Is the patient on SSRIs? If it's no, it's not a serotonin syndrome. If it's yes, tremor. And that's actually as it gets worse. Uh, muscle rigidity, fever, ocular clonus. Uh, also, clonus is um, a key um, you know, feature to diagnose this syndrome, either inducible or spontaneous. There's no lab needed for that. <coughs> um, happens within 6 to 24 hours. So it's actually hard to miss. Like you prescribe the medicine today, you get the call next morning. And also important to know that if the patient calls you two weeks later, with problems, it's probably not that, unless the patient has taken more than what they should take. So I always ask, did you, did you double up on the medicine? Did you take something else? So it, that makes it actually easier for us to diagnose. Again, this is a, a table of differential diagnosis of the most common syndromes that can mimic serotonin, anticholinergic syndrome, neuroleptic, and malignant hyperthermia. Gonna skip. It's an important slide, but I'm going to skip it because of the time. Again, the ones who are interested, you know, I'll send them this, um, the whole file. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome, though, is one that I would like people to know because we do prescribe medication that can cause uh, neuroleptic neuro malignant syndrome, which is basically anti-dopaminergic -dop medications. There are psych meds, but we try them sometimes here for either, like Reglan is one. Uh, there are other medicines that are prescribed for the treat pain, all the schizophrenia patients, uh, schizophrenia medications. Neuroleptic molecular syndrome is actually a slow syndrome. Serotonin is a quick one, so the onset is under 24 hours with serotonin versus uh, NMS, it takes weeks to happen. And the recovery also the same. When you stop the agent, say you have the patient on tramadol with SSRIs, and they got serotonin syndrome. You stop the tramadol, patient get better. If the patient doesn't get better, think of NMS. 
see here, uh, 24 hours versus 9 days. When um, the only workup you need is to rule out other treatable causes of the symptoms that you see, drug screen, as you see all illicit drugs can cause the issue and the patient will not tell you that. Uh, thyroid functions, uh, infection workup, um, glucose, it's basically a panel just to rule out any other organic <coughs> problems. So I am hoping we'll get to do this here, I just uh, an idea on how things go. Management of mild cases, just stop the medication. Benzodiazepines always help. Kids with moderate to severe that require uh, serotonin antidote. One of those three drugs. Piperoheptadine, chlorpromazine, and ketanserine. And you can see part of the supportive care, cooling the patient, uh, sedation, alkalinizing the urine. Um, and you see the bottom here, why people die from this is because serotonin syndrome end with this if you don't treat it. Respiratory failure, renal failure, and cardiomyopathy. And if not sure, just treat, treat supportively. That's also an important slide. And that's what we do most of the time in recovery rooms. Uh, try to find the drug is causing it, and if not, just uh, um, give the patient some midazolam, intubate if needed, and relax the patient. Because what kills the patient is the rigidity. The, the, when the muscles actually goes in that vicious circus of hyperactivity, they get febrile, rhabdomyolysis, the kidneys shut down, and the stand. Let's skip this one. I don't think this related to, we don't stop antidepressants. Because stopping antidepressants will cause patients to get suicidal uh, versus knowing that they have the antidepressant support and be cautious what we're giving them. This is a, a wiser way. That's the end.